was actually an early adopter of anomaly detection software a decade ago. It wasn't my decision, but it was rolled out across all of the sites at my previous employer, and I was responsible for OT security at one of those sites. These men in suits essentially showed up at my site, plugged the technology in, gave me a thumbs up, and then left, and it proceeded to be the bane of my existence. <laughs> it wasn't tuned. We didn't have the resources to tune it, so needless to say, it created a lot of noise. And it got so bad that a bunch of us that were responsible for this technology at the various sites started to collude on how we could get rid of it. One day our answer came. Unfortunately for my colleague, it was on Christmas Day, and his plant went down. And when he went to troubleshoot what caused it, he traced it back to the anomaly detection software, which had caused so much chatter on his network that it took his entire plant down. All in, they lost $1 million in unscheduled downtimes. But we had won the ultimate prize, which was authorization to unplug the technology, throw it in a fire and dance around it. And it looked a little bit like this. Now, you all know when you're looking at this picture that it's only this one because I couldn't get the rights to the office space image, so just picture that one instead. <laughs> but I still have what I would affectionately call anomaly mares to this day. Now, I know that we've come a really long way since then. We've gotten better about how we install the technology so that no matter how much chatter it causes on the network, it's not going to take our plants down. We've gotten better at the learning behavior so that we're able to tune this technology more effectively and it's not going to create that much chatter in the first place. And I've had to come to terms with the fact that this software is not going anywhere and it's actually becoming pretty impressive. And ultimately, the current market saturation of anomaly detection software means that we as an industry have come to terms with the fact that it's not if we're going to get attacked, it's when. But even though this technology is not going to cost us $1 million in unscheduled downtime, how effective is it at reducing our risk for the cost? So I want to challenge us today to think about how much risk anomaly detection software reduces what we need to do in order to realize that reduction in risk, and what that really costs. Or whether we as an industry have started to contract collective shiny object syndrome like we did a decade ago, and we may be able to use that capital more effectively to reduce our risk. So I want to start by agreeing on what we need to do to install this technology and run and maintain it effectively. First, I want to talk about obtaining visibility of your entire network. I think we can all agree that we need to tap the network firewalls between each network level so that we get all north-south traffic visibility. But there's often a lot of debate about whether it's worth the extra investment to tap the east-west traffic as well. But I have seen an instance where removal media or a portable computer was directly connected to a level two component and it infected it with malware. And then that malware was not trying to communicate out to the internet, it was only communicating across that network level. So without, anomaly, without uh, the east-west traffic visibility, it would have been completely undetectable. So I would argue that you need to make the investment regardless. You either need full east-west traffic visibility as well, or you would need to invest in robust removal media controls so that this scenario is not possible in the first place. Secondly, as you heard in my original story, this technology is nothing more than noise if it's not tuned effectively. So what does that look like? This is obviously dependent on the type of technology that you're installing and the number of components that you have at your site. But if we take an average refinery, we find that after the initial learning period, there will be about 150 alerts per day. Now, if you have a dedicated resource for about two weeks tuning that down, they can get that down to about 25 alerts per day. Now, that is much more manageable, but it is still useless if you expect your existing resources at site to investigate each of these alerts because we find that it takes an average of one day per alert to investigate each of those 25 alerts and determine whether it's a, a false detection, a network issue that needs to be resolved, or an incident. So in order to take advantage of these alerts, we really do need eyes on screen 24 by 7 by 365 with an OT SOC. So what does it really take to have an appropriately sized OT SOC? In theory, 
your level one OT SOC could have 24 seven coverage with four people when you take into account sick leave, holidays, et cetera. But in reality, then when that one person on shift is off investigating an incident, then you have no eyes on screen. So in, you really do need to double that. There's some caveats to this. Obviously, the more money you invest in tuning in the first place, the less people you would need on your level one OT SOC. Secondly, level one OT SOC automation is becoming really popular, but likely in the short term, this will be a zero sum game because you'd still need this team of people to establish that and run and maintain it. ISA states that one person can reasonably manage about 150 alerts per day, so this team of eight could manage approximately 10 sites. Each of these individuals need to have strong network security and IT skill set. So they need to understand how network traffic flows, protocols, packet creation, et cetera. They would then escalate to the level two OT SOC, which could be four people so that you have one person on shift at all times. And these people would need to have really strong automation knowledge. So they need to understand what should communicate with what on an OT network. And then they would escalate to the level three OT SOC, which could be one person per business line or region. And this person needs to have really strong process knowledge. So they need to understand the entire automation network. They need to understand the entire DCS. And ideally, they would have access to those components as well so that they can troubleshoot further. Now, keep in mind that if you already have an existing IT SOC, you will likely still need these numbers in order to take on the additional capacity and the skill set required. So now that we've agreed on what we need to do to effectively run and maintain this technology, what does this actually cost? I'm going to break this down into one-time costs and then run and maintain costs, which aren't often spoken about, and we find that organizations are under budgeting for this. So starting with one-time costs, your initial installation costs could easily cost you about $70,000 to have a team of two to three people walking your site for an entire week, running fiber and copper, spanning your ports, installing the technology. Now there's a hidden cost here because keep in mind that when those men in suits showed up at my site, I had to escort them around the entire week, and then I had to provide them documentation up front so that they could prepare. So we'll add on a hidden cost here of about $20,000 of your staff's time. Now tuning, usually takes one person about two weeks. That could easily cost around $30,000 per site. But yet again, there's a hidden cost here of your staff's time because they will be heavily relied on to answer questions about what normal behavior looks like on their network. Uh, lastly, if we assume that you're going to tap the east-west traffic and the north-south traffic, the average site requires about four appliances, so we're looking at about $40,000 for appliances and software, and that's also assuming that your network equipment is in close proximity to, to each other. So all in, we're looking at a proposed cost of about $140,000 per site, which seems kind of reasonable. If I have a, a company with 10 sites, I invest 1.4 million, and voila, I'm secure. But the biggest hidden cost here is easily around $500,000 to establish your SOC procedures, configure that ticketing software, train your SOC, and then train your personnel on the anomaly detection platform. So in reality, we're looking at more like $680,000 per site or $230,000 per site if you divide the cost of that SOC across your 10 sites. OK, run and maintain annual costs. Your annual license support, your central monitoring software could cost you around $58,000. The hidden costs here are in the service callouts and then the optional add-on software like threat intelligence. I'm not going to talk too much today about the optional add-on software, but keep in mind that the more that you purchase add-on software and the more service callouts you require, this is really where the companies make their money because it increases your annual costs. Now we need to pay our SOC. So I'm going to use US wages, keeping in mind that if you deploy a SOC in a different country, obviously the wages are going to be really different. But proportionally, the results that I'm going to get to today are the same, so just bear with me. A level one OT SOC analyst could cost for that skill set about $50,000. So we have eight of those. Level two OT SOC skill set could cost around $100,000, and there's four of those. And then your level three OT SOC person could cost around $150,000 for that skill set. Now, keep in mind that 
an employee's wage is not actually the fully burdened cost to you as an employer. Usually that's about half of their wage added on. So I'm adding that on in hidden costs here. Also, we'll add another $120,000 approximately for your SOC ticketing software annual fees, the building costs, and then your SOC's equipment costs. So what looks like around a $1 million run and maintain annual fee is more like $1.6 million if you're a one-site company, or if you have 10 sites, $225,000 per site. This is a lot of money to not take into account from the beginning. Sales teams are not incentivized to talk about this, and we find that organizations under budget by 50% on their run and maintain annual costs. And my point here is that we need to be willing to spend the money to install and maintain this software. Otherwise, your money is better spent elsewhere because your employees will also be throwing this technology to fire and dancing around it. So those of you that know me, know that I couldn't possibly speak for 30 minutes without talking about risk. So let's talk about this from a risk perspective. This is the engineering bow tie. If there's engineers in the room, you likely recognize this or something similar to this because it's commonly used for conducting safety has ops. I like to use it when talking about OT cyber risk because it already translates to the engineers in the room when I want to ask them questions about the ultimate impacts of our cyber risk. Now, we don't need to understand the entire engineering bow tie for me to illustrate my point today, but I do need us to all agree and understand the term top event. The top event is the first possible cause of any potential consequence. So the beauty of using the engineering bow tie when talking about OT cyber risk is that it allows us to take a seemingly infinite threat landscape and an infinite number of potential consequences and boil it down into a finite list of top events. And I find the easiest way to understand this is with a simple example. I'm Canadian, so I always use the example of winter driving. And to put things into perspective, about a week and a half ago, my hometown was the coldest place on the entire earth for two days. So I know a thing or two about winter driving. There's a couple different top events that would apply to this, but uh, one such top event would be skidding on ice. This is a perfect top event because nothing has actually happened yet. However, there's a multitude of consequences that could happen, such as hitting a pedestrian, going in the ditch, causing a car accident. But the first possible cause of all of those things was the fact that I started skidding on the first place. On the left-hand side of the bow tie, we want to put in preventative controls that will reduce the likelihood that I start skidding. So an example of that would be winter tires. On the right-hand side of the bow tie, our goal is to implement mitigating controls that will reduce the impact of skidding on the ice given that I've started skidding on the ice. An example of that would be winter driver training. So although I did it proactively, winter driver training teaches me how to control a skid on ice. So ideally, I'm able to reduce the impact or completely mitigate the impact and prevent anything from happening given that I've started skidding on the ice. So with that context, Anomaly detection software sits entirely on the right-hand side of the bow tie and completely ignores preventative controls that we can put in place on the left-hand side of the bow tie. But then you're going to say to me, but Rebecca, I don't sell anomaly detection software. I sell OT threat detection software. And I utilize threat intelligence to write signatures that will either notice a trend or notice a threat and immediately quarantine it or preventing it from turning it into an incident. So isn't that preventative? But the reality is, for that threat to flag on the software, something has had to happen on your network. So that top event has already occurred. The only exception to this is if you're utilizing threat intelligence or services like ICS CERT in such a way that you notice trends at other companies or you notice a specific software is being targeted and you proactively address it with a patch or by, for example, changing your firewall rules. Then you are on that left-hand side of the bow tie. But anomaly detection software, or OT threat detection software, or whatever you want to call it, in its purest form, sits solely on the right-hand side of the bow tie. So then the question becomes, are there other things that we can do where we could implement technical controls that we're commonly ignoring? One such example would be dedicated OT security personnel. And why do I use that as an example? If we look at the initial costs that we talked about, 
For the same cost as deploying anomaly detection software, you could employ 10 dedicated OT security personnel at one site. Or if you're a company with 10 sites, you could have one to two dedicated OT security personnel at each of your 10 sites. Now, you might not think that's impressive to have even one dedicated OT security personnel. But back when I started, there were 150 sites in my previous employer, and I was at the only site with a dedicated OT security personnel. Since then, they realized that was a problem, and they put a program in place to address it. But the common solution at the time, and the very common solution that I still see in companies today, is that they say that they have OT security personnel, but in reality, what they've done is combined it with the DCS engineer role. Now, why is this a problem? I, share an off I shared an office with the DCS engineer back a decade ago, and his entire job was reactive. He was out in the field troubleshooting issues. He was replacing PLCs. He was doing things that were urgent to keep that plant running, and he had no time for anything else. My job, if I was doing it well, was primarily proactive. So you can see the rub when we combine these two roles into one person and we call that a solution to the problem, that that person will never have time to get to the proactive work as they will always be responding to incidents and problems and troubleshooting to keep that plant running. So I could go on a whole tangent here about why this isn't successful, but I, I hope I've at least convinced you that it is really important to have a dedicated OT security personnel. But then you're going to ask, well, what can one dedicated focal point actually do? Well, one dedicated focal point could employ all of the controls that you see on the screen. I know this because I did this. I deployed a governance model and user training that was rolled out annually. I provided awareness training at our quarterly safety meetings. I changed our management of change procedure to have questions so that if anything was it potential, had the potential of impacting us from a security perspective, we had the right reviewers in place. I managed our asset inventory and our user accounts and our remote user accounts. I reviewed our ACLs and our firewall rules with our network engineer quarterly. I deployed portable media technology that completely blocked all USB keys aside from a few based on serial number. I deployed laptop cabinets out in the field so that when engineers were done with configuring the PLCs, they would plug in the laptops to get charged overnight, and as a bonus, they would get updated as well. I deployed quarterly security patches and weekly antivirus definition files. We had a robust incident response plan. We took quarterly backups. We tested our restores. I established all of this with the support of one other resource, but I was able to run and maintain this with quarterly self-assurance checks on my own at one of the largest refineries in North America. Now, you'll notice that what's missing here is that we did have logging so that we could review our logs in the event of an incident, but we didn't have monitoring. And that is precisely where anomaly detection software comes into play. But then there's two arguments that you make for anomaly detection software. The first argument is you say, well, I think it's going to reduce my risk most effectively, so I'm going to put anomaly detection software in place first. But then you're going to need to argue that that anomaly detection software will reduce your risk more effectively than all of these controls on the screen for the same investment. And that's going to be a really difficult argument to make. The second option is that you say, well, I already have all those controls on the screen. So I'm adding anomaly detection software to my program. And I would say, congratulations, that's an impressive program that we rarely see. But then you're forgetting about the diminishing return on additional controls. And what I mean by that is that if you deploy anomaly detection software on its own, the risk reduction that you get is much greater than when you add it to the existing controls on the screen. So then you need to argue that anomaly detection software is still worth the investment even after taking into account the diminishing return on additional controls. And that's also going to be a really difficult argument to make. So the moral of the story here is that if we invest in anomaly detection software, we have to be willing to accept that we are deploying a mitigating control and that we are completely ignoring preventative controls. We also have to be able to justify that we believe we are reducing our risk more effectively than what a dedicated OT security personnel could do for the same investment. So after all of that, you may not think that I'm an advocate of anomaly detection software, but that's not the case. I just want to have an honest conversation about technology and the cost-benefit analysis of it 
that many of us are not willing to have. I have seen firsthand how effective this technology can be when it's installed with full visibility of the network, tuned to a reasonable number of daily alerts, and then implemented with a sustainable support structure in place. And I have seen it save companies that I've worked with millions of dollars. But we need to be all in on the technology that we are investing in. I've also heard the analogy that you can't solve problems that are hiding in the dark and that anomaly detection software is the equivalent of turning the lights on for your network. And that's a beautiful and true sentiment. But if you don't have someone standing in the room to see what was hiding in the dark when you turn those lights on, then you've just paid a lot of money to light up a room. And it might look pretty, but it's not serving any purpose. So we need to come to terms with the fact that it is going to be a significant investment for us to achieve real and sustainable value from this technology. If we take those one-time costs that I talked about earlier and we absorb those over 10 years, which is the average lifespan of the technology, and then we add those to the run and maintain costs, it's going to be a total of $1.7 million annually for one site or $250,000 annually per site if you have 10 sites in your company. So it makes more financial sense as the number of sites increases. And it may absolutely make sense to deploy this technology if you have 100 sites within your company. But the majority of organizations that we see considering this software are not the shells and the chevrons of the world. If we look at this another way, that $1.7 million is equivalent to 29,000 barrels of oil. So that means that we're asking that one site to produce 29,000 more barrels of oil just to bring investment before we start adding value by minimizing the downtime. And if it was that simple to produce 29,000 more barrels of oil, the site would already be doing it. So then the question becomes, is there a better way to spend this money? This all is assuming that that site has $1.7 million to invest in the first place. So the question becomes, is the value of anomaly detection software equal to the value of dedicated OT security personnel, or equal to the value of other security initiatives, or equal to the value of just another initiative to improve production. So I'll leave you with this. If we put ourselves in the mindset of a decision maker at a refinery, we have to make a decision about whether to invest in security initiatives, which are very difficult to quantify, or in initiatives to improve production, which we can directly attribute to either reducing our costs or increasing our profits. And since we can't do that for security, the only way that we can justify security money and security investments is by justifying the estimated risk reduced. So with that, do we really believe that anomaly detection software is reducing our risk enough to justify the investment? Or have we just been distracted by another shiny object? Thank you.